age or some Victorian age. Today we are going to talk about uh, <clears throat> two literary texts. One is D. H. Lawrence, Sons and Lovers, and another one is a poem. The first one is a novel. The second one is a sailing to Vigentium. Is a poem written by W. B. Yeats. Okay, just a minute, let me share the screen. Okay, now the screen is visible to you. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so it is uh, unit number 22 and 23. And in this unit, there are two texts from English literature from the Victorian age, okay? That is the uh, late 19th and early 20th century. <clears throat> so the first text is uh, Sons and Lovers, written by D.H. Lawrence. It's a novel, okay? Uh, we will talk about it. And then another one is a poem, okay? Uh, it is written by W.B. Yeats. And it has been taken from a collection of poems called Easter 1916. And the name of the poem is Sailing to Byzantium. Okay. So let's begin with D.H. Lawrence. Now, uh, I hope that you must have gone through the backgrounds or the literary characteristics of this particular age, that is the Victorian age that begins from 1837 and ends with the death of the Queen Victoria, that is 1901. So, have you gone through or uh, you know did she you know talk about the background of that particular age okay if not i hope that she will cover it and now let's come to the point that is a text that we have to talk about in this class and before we jump to the novel that is the uh, you know the sonson's lover let us first you know briefly know about what who is you know dh lawrence the full form of D.H. here is David Howard Lawrence, okay? He is an English poet, writer, as well as novelist, okay? He was very famous at the time, but he was also very scandalous because of writing a novel or uh, dealing with some uh, sexual aspects of the society. And one of such famous novel is that is Lady Chatterley's Lover. This novel was banned at the time, but now it's one of the most popular novel in the world okay so dh lawrence was an englishman he was you know, he was born in 11 september 1885 in estoke and he died in 1930 in france okay so he became a teacher and he wrote stories as well okay I, as i mentioned but okay he was a poet he was a writer he was a novelist so being a writer, he wrote his stories as well, and he was a teacher of English literature as well. So during that time, he wrote some uh, beautiful short stories, and one, uh, two of them are like the White Peacock, and the other one is the Tree Passa. Okay. And uh, if we go to talk about his married life, he met with Von Ristofan and got married. Okay, they fall in love and they got married together. Now let's come to the novel that we have in our syllabus, that is Sons and Lover. Okay. Sons and Lover was published in 1913, that is the early 20th century. And it talks about a claustrophobic relationship with his mother. With his mother means the protagonist and, and his mother. Okay. It is a semi-autobiography. Why it is semi-autobiographical? What is an autobiography? Can you tell me, please? Can if a person writes his own biography, that is called autobiography. And what is a biography? Any person, suppose that you know, if a person is there and if any other person is writing for that particular person, then it is biography. Okay, which we so have. Yeah, so you mean to say that, okay, if you will write my biography, that will be called biography. And if I will write my own biography in my that own is hands, autobiography. that will be autobiography. Yeah, okay. So here, this novel, Sons and Lover, is quite autobiography. Why semi-autobiographical? Means there are some of the incidents, some of the events that has been 
directly taken or matched with the life of uh, D.H. Lawrence. But some of the other aspects are actually fictional. Okay, there is no current evidence, and though no match in the life of D.H. Lawrence, so that's why it is called semi-autobiographical work. Okay. Now, this story uh, that is the novel, the novel's story is actually uh, revolved around a family that is called the Morrill's family. Okay. Now here, Paul Morrill, the protagonist feels something for Marion and this is based on the real friendship with Jesus Chambers. And let me uh, clear one thing that this family has four members and the entire story actually revolves around these all four members. Okay. The book is set in the community similar to the author's birthplace. Okay. Now what was the author's birthplace? It was Eastwood in England. Okay. So the setting is also in the Eastwood of that particular novel, that is birthplace. Okay, that is his birthplace. Now, the historical background of the background of that particular novel. Now, see, I hope that you are also going through the literary theory classes and criticism classes. There, you must have heard of uh, neo criticism or reader response theory. Have you ever heard of these things? Have you ever heard of these things like uh, neo criticism, formalism, structuralism, and then uh, reader response? Yes, theory? Uh, we have heard, but we don't know exactly uh, what do they mean. In our okay. literary theory and the criticism classes, uh, okay. Madam has mentioned last week. Okay. Yeah, so that's very good. Well, these theories are actually, you can say that these theories are kind of lenses that you know, gives us some. Uh, multiplicity of an observation okay that gives us some multiple ways to see a particular thing in multiple ways okay so uh, in all these theories almost in neo criticism formalism and written response theory what they used to say is that okay when we are studying a literary work what we do not have to do is that we do not have to look into the background of the text we do not have to look into the background of the author we do not have to look into the intention of that particular author behind the publication or behind the writing of that particular work. But some theories are also there like in your history season, they actually uh, dismiss such kind of ideas because they used to say that, okay, until and unless we talk about what was the intention of that particular writer, we cannot remove that writer from the text, okay? But in some theories like reader response theories or if you go to deconstruction, they used to say that, okay, the death of the author is the birth of the reader. Until and unless that author will die, that means not literally. Okay, so when the text will be written, that means the author is dead. Okay, now it is the duty of the readers who will excavate the meaning from the text. Okay, so these are some of the common uh, things. So here, as I have you know gone through this one, that is the historical background. That's why I recall that aspects from literary theory. Now here, uh, you know, as we are learning, and this is important for us, we cannot experiment it using certain theories. We just have to go through the background. We just have to go through the plot of the novel. Okay. So that's why let's begin. Now Lawrence novel begins in 1885 and ends in 1911. So it 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 is it has a time span that is 1885 to 1911. And during that time, British miners tried to obtain a minor, try to obtain a better pay and safer working condition. Now, this was one of the condition uh, during that Victorian age, okay? Now, most of the people was, uh, were using to uh, work in the mines, okay? It could be a coal mines, it could be uh, some, you know, bricks mine and other mines, okay? So, there was a working class and there was a uh, bourgeois class. Okay. Now, bourgeois class were the actually upper class people, and the minor people are the miners were called the working class people or the lower class people, or you can also say that the middle class people at present time. Okay. Now, this uh, may show the uh, you can the, say the fight between the upper class and the lower class as well. Okay. Now, let's jump into the plot that is about. Uh, the Sons and Slava. Have you uh, ever gone through this novel earlier? Any one of you, have you ever gone through this novel? 
or any one of the novel of D.H. Lawrence. No? It's okay. See, uh, you have, I think uh, most of you have the book uh, that you have received from Brow, okay? But uh, if you will go through the book, it will be very easy for you to understand the novel, the background, because that these things are also being discussed in that particular book. If you don't have that book, you can simply follow this uh, PDF, okay, you know, take some snapshots as well. Now, let me make it... Uh, uh, if you don't mind, could you share it, sir? Uh, I can share it, but I do not have the right to share it. This is the problem. Okay. The problem is that okay. uh, from Brow, I haven't got any permission to share with you. And even I have been, you know, going through this request from other classes. Essential because I'm also taking the class in the fourth period, maybe in three to four thirty. Okay, so I will also take the class today as well in three to four four thirty p.m. Okay, in between that. So in that class we will talk about English language and linguistics, the growth of English language. So we will also meet with you. I will also meet with you again in today's class in the afternoon. Okay. So let's begin with the uh, plot that is, okay, the story talks about, okay, the story talks about Morel's family. As I already mentioned that it, it revolves, the story revolves around a family that is called Morel's family. And one more thing, let me tell you uh, and go back to the background of the title of this particular novel. This novel was actually been written not only once, okay, it was revised thrice and four times, okay. And when it was first written, D.H. Lawrence gave its title as Mall, oh, sorry, Paul uh, Morel. Okay. Later on, he changed its title into Sons and Loves. Okay, now come to the point that is the story talks about Morel's family. Jatrut Coppard was a bourgeois woman. Bourgeois means the upper class, okay, one who is aristocrat. So she was an aristocrat woman and Walter Morel. Walter Morel was a minor, made a Christmas party and a year after they were married. Now, these are the first generation, okay, that is Jatrud Copper and Walter Morel. Now, out of this, there will be some kids, okay, now who are they? There will be four children. Who are they? William, Arthur, Annie and Paul. So, these are the four kids of that particular couple, that is Walter Morel and Jatrud Copper. Now, see here, Jatrud Copper was an aristocrat, was a bourgeois. Okay, she may be the owner, she may be the daughter of the owner of that particular mine. And while Walter Morel was working as a miner, they got or they you know fell in love and they got married. Okay. Now see here, Paul was similar to his mother. Now, Paul, one of the kids who was similar to his mother. Now, in what sense he was similar? He was similar because he loved painting and worked in Nottingham. Okay, so as his mother was also have a fond of painting, he also had a fond of painting. Okay, he had a close relationship with his mother. In fact, he wanted that she lived forever with him. Now, here you can you know find out some kind of. Uh, homosexual or you know you can injustious relationship between mom and son or you can also say like that Oedipus complex or you can also say Electra complex so here you can uh, it, compare, compare it with Oedipus complex have you ever gone through Oedipus complex what is Oedipus complex do you know what is Oedipus complex yeah children they love one of their parents no, not only one of their parents, when the, it will be a, you know, child who will be a boy, okay? And if he will be in love with his mother, and in order to get his mother, when he will try to kill his father, okay? Because he thinks at the time that his father is the only enemy in between he and his mom. So in such kind of cases are called, you know, it was complex according to Sigmund Freud. 
Sigmund Freud was a psycho psychiatrist, and he gave such kind of theories. Okay, so we will uh, talk about that later on, if we will, you know, come across some literary theories as well. Now see him. So see, uh, he always want to live with his mom, okay, and he never wanted to leave her anyway. Now one day Paul and Gertrude went to all his farm, and here Paul met Maria, a young girl. Okay, now there, when they went to a farm, maybe it was a uh, farm nearest to their home. Okay, now once Paul and his mother went to that farm, that is all his farm, and there. Paul met with a girl that is uh, whose name is Miriam. Okay, they fell in love, but sometimes he hated her, even if he failed to belong to her whole. Sorry, uh, her who wanted a spiritual love. Okay, now the problem is that moral was uh, Paul. Paul was a kind of, you can say that a boy who used to make funds, who used to, you know, live in the moment. He doesn't have any kind of you know, strong emotions, feelings towards anyone, okay? So he lives in the moment. He doesn't care about what will be happening in future, what will be uh, the responsibilities. He, he, he is a carefree person. So that's why, uh, on the other hand, Miriam was a girl who was actually in spiritual love, okay, so she believes that, okay, his, uh, sh uh, her love is pure to that guy, that is Paul, but that's why there is a kind of, you know, a break between them, okay, because both of their thinking regarding love, their care was different from each other. Now, thanks to Maury, Miriam, he met Clara Downs, a married woman who broke off with her husband. Now, during this time when there was a kind of feature or break in between their relationship she met with a woman that is clara Dells, a married woman who broke off with her husband now they have also broken away or they has also been separated from each other so she met with her and maybe she was finding some kind of consolations as she and uh, as uh, as clara deals and uh, that is, you know, Miriam, both of their cases are almost quite similar. Now, Paul and Miriam had a real love story, but after some time, they broke up because he didn't want to get married. And the day, day after, he began a secret love story with Clara. Now, the problem against arise over here is that both of them meet with each other. Now, Clara and Miriam, both of them become friends. And now, the... You know, actually, attention of that particular guy, that is Paul, that shifted from Clara to, uh, sorry, uh, Miriam to Clara, that divorced, divorced woman. Okay, woman. Now, this was again a, a great problem. Now, see this. This is these are the some of the characteristics of D. H. Lawrence uh, novels or literary works, because in most of the works you will get to see that okay, some of the vulgarities of that particular society has been. Uh, you know, vividly portrayed in his works, and this was not actually acceptable at the time. Okay, that was in 1913 or 15. During that time, it was not acceptable in that society. Okay, so that's why his most of his novels were banned at the time. But now these novels are very popular. Okay, now when their uh, passion finished and Baxter uh, discovered the story. They broke up and she returned to her husband. Okay. Now, what happened uh, during this time? Okay. Uh, what can I say that? Okay. This Paul is a guy who is who loves to be as free, as carefree, okay, as irresponsible uh, as he can do. Okay. So he used to, you know, fly from one flat to an another flat. So this was a kind of nature of that particular guy. Okay, though he has a, a good fond, okay, towards his mother as well. So when uh, she, uh, sorry, Paul finds such kind of uh, things that okay, he is now bored with staying with Clara. He again broke up with her, and she returned to her husband once again. That is Clara Dews returned to her husband once again with whom 
seek uh, get divorced okay while paul was loving clara his mother got ill now during the time when he was in love with uh, clara dews paul's mother got ill who was the who was paul's mother who was paul's mother in this story jat root it was jat root moral isn't that not jat root coppered not moral it was jat root coppered okay now when paul was loving clara his mother got ill she had a cancer and when she got worse any and paul killed their mother giving had the morphine so she died the day after okay now the case is here is that she had a cancer and she was very ill so when she got worse any and paul killed their mother who the other kills other uh, other child that is any and paul killed their mother giving her morphine so she died day after now why did they kill you have to find it out if you will go through the text uh if you will go through any wikipedia or any notes you will find it i am just giving you a game over here you have to find it out so that you will get a chance to read the story once again okay the paul was alone and desperate because of his mother's death so he thought that miriam could help him okay now when he found that okay, his mother is dead clara has already left okay now he is very astonished with his own decisions and what he has done with him he was actually suffering from great, great guilt and so many things now at this time what he they thought that okay now miriam will be the only help in this situation for him they met for the last time she wanted to marry him but he refused so finally paul decided to face the situation with courage now again the in the first meeting in the last ride together they uh, that is uh, paul was still uh, reluctant to marry that uh, particular guy miriam okay sorry that particular girl miriam she was also ready at the time to marry him but she again refused and finally when he refused and become alone he actually become and try to give him consolation that okay no matter what has happened let it be i will again become strong and face the situation in a courageous way okay so this was the a kind of story of that particular novel in a very brief way you can go through it and you have to go through it okay because you have to face some questions related to the plot as well and whenever you will answer the questions you are supposed to go through the plot okay now what are the main features that not features you can say like the what are the main themes that has been discussed over here now here social difference has been shown here now why because in the very beginning of the plot we talked about two things okay that the mother that is jatrut coppert she belongs to an aristocratic family or maybe she was the daughter of a mine mine company a mine owner and on the other hand there was a worker there was a miner there was a worker who was paul morel paul morel or someone else it was walter morel sorry a walter morel was a worker okay now both of them Fall in love, fell in love. It's like a cinematographic scene. Okay, over here, as in cinemas and movies, we you know found such kind of things that has happened also in this particular novel, and this was quite true regarding the life of D. H. Lawrence. Okay, so it is based on true love story, a true incident of that particular situation. Now, another thing of this novel that we can say here is that <clears throat> it was complex. now can you imagine that okay if such kind of cases would happen in india or if the situation that has been narrated over here would not take in place in england and if you will replace that particular place that is england and with india what would be the conclusion of this particular uh, situation can you imagine <clears throat> just think of it within 2 minutes and let me know 
okay now what would be the conclusion if you will find that okay there is a upper class girl and there is a lower class man both of them fall in love they have to run away they have to get married what would be the after situation of that just think and let me know <clears throat> Can you think about anything? <clears throat> what could be the situation? What could be the after effect of that relationship? It is very obvious, isn't that? In our society, people are so aggressive in such kind of cases. They are very emotional, they are very attached, and they are very egoistic. So if such kind of cases would happen, like there is a high-born girl <clears throat> and a lower class boy who fall in love with each other they, they ran away okay if i will talk about south indian films okay so in such cases you will find that okay the family the family members of that girl could be a minister she could be daughter of a minister and there could be you know a man who is a working from a working class family so what would happen they will chase that particular guy and if possible, they will try to kill that guy. Okay? That hero will be killed, even though uh, <clears throat> he belonged to a very lower class family. So such kind of cases can happen in India. But okay, yeah, the story has been twisted and turned to another thing that has been shown. That is the relationship complexity. Okay? The complexity of the relationship has been shown over here. And now that complexity give a kind of signals to Oedipus complex. As I have already mentioned that, okay, this <clears throat> uh, this uh, theory or this concept has been given or described by Sigmund Freud. He was a psychiatrist or psychologist. He wrote so many books regarding psychology and psychoanalysis theory. And in that theory, he has talked about all these things. Have you ever gone through the drama written by uh, Sophocles, that is Oedipus Rex? That is a Greek drama. Of the, I think uh, it was written some uh, 2800 years ago. Have you ever gone through that story, Oedipus Rex? No, sir. Okay, so that is a beautiful history, and that is the base of this term, that is Oedipus complex. In that history, what happened? There is a king of Corinth. Corinth is a place. Okay, there is a king which uh, <clears throat> I have forgotten the name of the particular king. So there was a king of Corinth, and the queen was also there. The queen's name was Jocasta. Actually, Jocasta was the mother of Oedipus. Okay. <clears throat> Now, during that time, it was almost 3,000 uh, 3, years ago, so there was a system that, okay, whatever was happening during that time in the kingdom, so the king always take permissions, take suggestions from uh, the oracles. Now, the, who are the oracles? Oracles are a kind of, you can say, that uh, astrologers or at, at, at present time. So, they are kind of the priests who used to guide from religious point of view. So, when uh, the king's wife was pregnant, the king called the oracles and they made some kind of prophecies that, okay, if this child will come to this world, he will kill you, that means the king, and marry his mother. Okay? So in order to avoid this prophecy, what the king did, he, when this child, you know, actually come out of his mother's home into this world, the king ordered two of his workers to take the child far away from the kingdom and left him okay, in a jungle. Okay. Now, as 
followed the request of the king they took the child and they left the child into the jungle now there was a neighbor country where there was another king and a queen okay now this king and queen doesn't have any child they were very unhappy because of this so when the king came to that jungle for hunting deer he found or he actually heard the cry of a child now there he found that child even though actually the king that is the father of that child told the workers told the servants to kill that child or to throw the child from the hills they didn't do that the workers didn't do that in love of that particular child okay so the child was alive at that time and that king who came for hunting he actually took the child and take him to his own country and they nourished that child and he grew up and once what happened is that he had to come to again the uh, kingdom that is called the corinth okay the corinth king the corinth was what uh, a place and in that place his father and his mother was living now once what happened now uh, uh, that is edipus the child has grown up and now he has become edipus so he came and there was a place where three roads okay there was a one point and three roads go to three ways in that place what happened he found his father and even he didn't recognize that he is his original father at that time what happened they had some kind of a you know, quarrel with each other and during with that meantime he actually killed his father unknowingly okay unwillingly he killed his father and went to the kingdom and you may know that okay once the king will be killed by someone a brave guy the queen will be that will be of that person so now as for the rule of that system jokasta that is his own mother become his uh, wife and she was also ignorant about the thing that okay he is my own son they had marriage they actually had also two or three children as well but when at the end of the story they got to know both of them got to know so uh, that jokasta is my mother and edipus will also got to know that so what will happen is that jokasta will hang herself in a rope with fan and uh, edipus will give orders to his you know workers to make him blind okay so such kind of cases happen in this particular story that is what is called oedipus complex and from this story this concept has been tried by sigmund freud okay isn't it a very good story yes sir though, yeah though it is a fairy tale or it could be a fairy kind of tale but you know the greek the stories the dramas that has been written by the greek philosophers the greek writers that is the base of all the things that we have right now in our literature in our theory okay because they were so much developed almost 3000 years ago and all the theories all the critical you know philosophies that has been drawn by plato aristotle socrates all this theory at the basis of the you know you can can say that the philosophy of the world okay so now whatever we have in present day are based on the theories or the concept that has been given by plato aristotle homer then we have dante allegri all these writers now see let's look on other some things like social and romantic bondages now yes obviously we have got to know that there are social and romantic bondages has been also been shown over here the social bondages and romantic bondages we have seen here that some people had in a relationship between uh, each other okay and social bondages that is the upper class and lower class system has also been shown over here there is a mingling or there is a uh, you can say that a shadow line between the upper class and lower class okay because we haven't find any kind of quarrel any kind of fight because of this kind of association that is when the upper class and the lower class associated with each other there is no kind of fight fight is it so that's also a kind of good bondage over here the contrast between body and mind yeah 
so this is one of the the most important thing you can say like that okay when we talk about paul paul was a man who lives in the moment and who doesn't care about emotions or about the mind whatever he feels good for him he used to do he doesn't care about others emotions feelings love respect on the other hand if we will talk about clara dews if we talk about uh, that girl whose his name was uh, what was the name miriam okay so he never thought about their you know feelings and emotions so that has been a kind of a contrast between the body and the mind okay now this novel is also about uh, deals with the psychological uh, factor because until and unless psychology will be there we can't talk about the oedipus complex we can't talk about the you know body and mind complex isn't that so can you read this portion what is written over here the psychological novel can you read this out loud any one of you i have talked about it but just you read it okay this one says psychological novel yes yes it was published only a few years after the ideas of s freud and the writers began to be influenced by freud's theory of freud it's it's uh, freud sorry freud's theory of oedipus complex in this novel the main character is the mother who has a bad marriage and she tries to be happy by eating up her son's life yeah so that is what has been the gist you can say that this is the gist of the theory of the concept that is called oedipus complex it's not oedipus o will be silent over here okay so it's oedipus complex there is an another concept that is called electra complex and both this concept has been given by sigmund freud okay sigmund freud was a uh, psychologist as i also already have mentioned and this novel was written when this novel was written it was in 1930 isn't that now can you tell me why 19, 1913 is famous or memorable in india what event has happened or what was the thing that had happened during 1930 in india and because of that we may remember this date i mean this year Uh, it says uh yes a great man got nobel prize now who is that man who got the first nobel prize in india tagore yes ravindra tagore received a nobel prize for literature for writing gitanjali or songs of offerings okay so that's why this year is very important and now as we have mentioned over here that when this theory was being come into the existence or come into currency after a few years of this theory d h lawrence wrote this novel and he was greatly influenced by this theory and he used it practically in this novel okay now when did this theory came up this theory came up in 1899 okay and almost a decades later dr d h lawrence published this novel okay now as i have already mentioned this uh, lawrence rewrote the novel four times at the beginning the title was paul morel but finally it becomes sons and lovers now what was the style of writing this particular novel the novel was actually written in the nottinghamshire dialect that was a dialect of the place where d h lawrence used to live the author uses always the word ness ness okay so ness is a, a, a kind of you know a word that is related to the nottinghamshire dialect lawrence adopts the omniscient narrator now who is omniscient narrator what is the role of omniscient narrator can you tell me there are so many types of narrator in uh, literary works that is first person narrator second person narrator third person narrator and then omniscient narrator 
Now, what is the difference between all this? Can anyone tell me quickly? If you know, you can add it, okay? I'm not forcing you, otherwise I will tell you. Okay, let me tell you. The first person narration, narration or narrative is that there are four kinds of narration. One is first person, second person, third person, and omniscient. Okay. So in first person narr narration, the speaker, no, sorry, in novel, there will be narrator. Okay. The narrator will narrate himself, or there will be the use of I. Okay. Instead of say he, she, they. So here the writer will use the first person narrator. He will use to present it as I. And if it will be second person, so you will use to speak in you and you. Okay. In third person, simply there will be a third person point of view. That is when I will say that, okay, uh, Paul Morel, then I will say he was the boy or he was the son of Gertrude Coppard and Walter Morel. And when I use he, she, they, these third person singular or plural forms, at that time this will become a third person narrative or narrator. But who is omniscient narrator? Omniscient narrator is one. Sometimes we used to say the God is omniscient. Omniscient means who is present everywhere. Isn't that? God is present everywhere. You just have to have that, you know, you can say that uh, capacity to, you know, feel that thing. So the next thing is that omniscient in omniscient narrator, so this narrator will be present throughout the text, but you will not feel that, okay, he's inside the text. He will be outside the text. He will observe all the characters and he will also know that which character is going to deliver which you know, speech, which character is going to, uh, you know. Uh, so he will have, you know, you can say that all kind of information regarding the novel. And when he will find that, okay, there is something missing, he will put his own statement there. That is what is called omniscient narrator. Okay. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, say there is also the cli uh, sorry, cinematic technique in the description. It is structured episodically. Now, the novel is actually structured in episodic form. So, that's why it is said that okay uh, the novel also has some kind of you know cinematic ca characteristics okay now parallelism this is an another aspect of that particular thing we can make a parallelism or sorry parallel between dickens and lawrence now dickens charles dickens is also a very important writer of the victorian age did you have any novel and any work of this writer in your syllabus this time because i didn't go through the syllabus i simply got the ppt from your madam she told me to took the class and I'll take i think hard times is there sir okay hard times is there that's also a very good novel hmm. that's also talk about the hard times of the time okay during the uh, uh, sorry during the uh, industrial revolution Okay, so here Dickens in Hard Times wrote a description of Cocktown that is similar to Lawrence's description of the industrial setting, Nottinghamshire, coal fields in the first chapter. Yeah, obviously there is a similarity. So if you have gone through that particular novel as well, you will find it. Okay, there is nothing to describe. Okay, then you will find also a movie based on the novels that is Sons and Lovers, inspired also a movie in 1960s. Directed by Jack Cardiff with Dean Stockwell as Paul and Wendy Hiller as Jatrut. Okay, so there are two characters who actually perform the roles of Paul and that is Jatrut. Mm -hmm. Now, so this was all about this particular novel that is Sons and Lovers. Okay. I hope that uh, it is clear to you. And now if you will go through if you will go through the just a minute
Is it visible to you? Is the PPT visible yes, to you? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. So, so far we have talked about TH Lawrence. We have talked about some some level and some of the basic themes, the plot, the background, the historical aspects, some of the theories, narrative techniques. So, so far, if you have any question regarding that, you can ask me. Uh, take some time, that is two or three minutes, and let me know if you have anything. Okay. Otherwise, let me know that, okay, you want to proceed to the next work that is sailing to Byzantium. That's a poem. And I'm going not going to read that poem you know, one by one or line by line. I will just discuss the features, the thematic aspects, and all that. Thing. Okay. So if you want to ask any kind of queries or questions, you can ask. Okay, let's move on. Okay, if I hope that you do not have any query, you do not have any questions. So let's move on to the next topic that is selling to Byzantium. It's written by WB Eats. Okay. WB Eats. Have you heard of WB Eats? Where is he from? Is, is he from England or America or any other country? Okay, so let me tell you that W.B. Eats, whose full name is William Butler Eats, he is an Irishman, that is, he is from Ireland. Okay? And he is, you can say that he is the national poet of that particular uh, country, Ireland. And uh, he was very famous at the time because he started so many, you know, literary. Uh, groups or you can say that he started a theater called Abbey Theater at the time. So he's part of many literary movements as well as he contributed to the field of literature, to the field of you know other you know, artistic and dramatic aspects of that particular country. That's why he's a national part of that country. He's very famous not only in Ireland but also in uh, but also in uh, other countries as well. Just a minute. Okay. Now so let's uh, talk about this sailing to Byzantium. Now, what is the meaning of sailing and what is the meaning of Byzantium? Sailing means to sail to somewhere, you know, through boat or through ship in oceans, okay. To Byzantium means someone is sailing to Byzantium. Byzantium is the name of the place. Now, Byzantium is called Insta Istanbul right now, I think, okay. So, it is in Turkey. That was a, a you know, very pious place or religious place where the Christians used to visit, okay, as the Muslim used to visit Mecca. Of their house, so Hajj. So, these uh, Christians used to visit that Byzantium, that was a very religious place for them. Okay, so here this poem is actually about W.B. Yeats himself. Okay, he is fed it up with his life. Now, he is in a very, uh, you know, uh, you can say the end of his life when he was 61 or 60. Okay, at the age of 60 or 61, he used to uh, he write this poem. Okay, he, he, he write this poem and this poem is actually about about this transience or permanence, okay? Now, what is transience and permanence? Permanence is something that is permanent throughout the, you know, throughout the life, not only throughout life, 
throughout the time when uh, or till the last day of this entire globe so this is what is called permanence but what he used to feel is that he feels that okay his life is not permanent so what he can do is that okay he wants to get something divine okay he want to elevated his soul to become permanent okay now see we will uh, talk about this later on let's first talk about uh, the basic things about this poem selling to byzantium now selling to byzantium written in 1926 is an emphatic reminder of the poet's keen interest in that historic city of eastern empire and the significance of art and culture okay so it's a kind of you know emphatic reminder you can say that he is talking about byzantium once that was the hub of art and culture that was also during that time we talk about have you i think you, you have gone through uh, the fall of constantinople so that was constantinople was once the hub of literature art culture and that was in its fullest form at that time but after the fall of constantinople it actually loses its grace and all other things so it is a kind of reminder of that particular time now the poem uses a journey to constantinople that is byzantium right uh, right now it's constantinople but at that time it was byzantium as a metaphor for a spiritual journey now what is a spiritual journey a journey could be physical journey that is from your childhood to your adulthood and then the old age okay so here he is talking about a spiritual journey that is he wants to uh, do some kind of meditation he is actually talking about the journey of the soul from darkness to light from 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 evil to goodness okay so such kind of journey is called a spiritual journey he wants to elevate his soul from uh, from all kind of guiles all kind of you know false identities through the use of various poetic techniques yeats describes the metaphorical journey of a man pursuing his own vision of the eternal life as well as his conception of paradise so here actually he talks about his spiritual journey and this journey is not a journey that we used to do or struggle to get a job to you know settle in our life to build our career it is a journey that is spiritual and that leads to paradise that is heaven Okay. Okay. Yet explores his thoughts and musings on how immortality, art, and the human spirit may converge. Now, what he used to say in this poem is that he says that immortality, art, and human spirit both are very important in the world of spirituality because. immortality is one thing that cannot be happened in any form to the living beings that is here in this world art is something that can be immortal why art is immortal because the things that has been written some 3000 years ago 4000 years ago is still present and they are in our culture it 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 has been read by all the people throughout the world almost those who are educated those who have gain interest in education reading and writing they used to read them so he wants to make his life his make his life as as an art okay so that he can keep it as immortal as art is okay the human spirit may converse okay you see the next one there are some uh, you know lines has been taken from that particular poem and has been illustrated over here okay that is no country for old men this is the first line of the particular poem just a minute okay so this is the first line and this poem has been uh, written in three stanzas okay there are three stanzas and 24 lines now <coughs> the form of this writing is or the stanza form is called otabaraima have you heard of otabaraima otabaraima any one of you let it be so otava rhyme is a rhyme or is a way of writing poetry 
where there will be eight iambic pentameter lines in a stanza. Now, what is pentameter? Pentameter is a you know prosodiac uh, foot, you can say. Now, see this uh, line that is that is no country for old men. If you will divide this entire sentence or entire line into different syllables and put it into two syllabic, three syllabic foot, you will find that it has five foots and both the foots, uh, all the foots are uh, iambic. Iambic means the second syllable in a foot will be stressed. Okay, not the first syllable. Like if that is a two syllabic foot, so is will be here uh, stressed. Okay. No country is a foot, so country will be stressed. For old men, so for old, that is also a foot, so old will be stressed. So there are five foots in each lines, and each lines have iambic pentameter rhyme scheme. So when such kind of rhyme will be used, this is what is called Otava Rhyme, and this was first used by Giovanni Boccaccio. I hope that you have heard of Boccaccio. Boccaccio was a very famous writer as well. And uh, if you will have ever gone through Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, okay, so that Canterbury Tales has been, you know, taken or inspired from Boccaccio's Decameron. Decameron is a work that has been written by Boccaccio. He was a, I think, uh, Italian. Yeah, he was from Italy. So he wrote it first, Decameron, and then. Geoffrey Chaucer, you know, inspired from that work, and he started writing Canterbury Tales. Okay, now let's go into the poem that is, that is no country for old men. The young one in one another's arms, birds in the trees. Now here the speaker actually referring to the country that is Ireland, okay? That is no country for old men. Now what is that country is? That country is Ireland, where from? He is that he has lived says that it is not the country for old men. It is full of youth and life, with the young lying in one another's arms, birds singing in the trees and fish swimming in the waters. Okay, so he's talking about his own country. That this country is not for me because I am old enough. That country is for the kids. That country is for the you know animals. Those who are chirping. Those who are singing. Okay. This country is for the youths, those who live their lives and leaning against someone's arms. Okay, so this is not for old people because the old man doesn't have any fond of anything in this world. What they used to do is that they used to live their life, they used to finish their life in a very tranquil and calm way. They want peace instead of chaos. Okay, because they had lost their energy of their body. Now they become more spiritual, they become more you know, convincing towards religious powers. So that's why he said that this country is now no more for me. Okay, the next thing is that an exit man is but a paltry thing. Okay, so he's uh, derogatorily saying that okay, an exit man is nothing but a paltry, that is chicken. Okay, a paltry thing, uh, a tattered cord upon a stick, unless okay. It's a very beautiful, actually, uh, uh, comparison here. You can say that, okay? So an old man, as you can say, that is a paltry thing. Merely tattered coat upon a stick, unless his soul can clap it hand and sing. And the only way for the soul to learn how to sing is to study uh, monuments, okay? Now, what he used to say or wants to say over here is that, when people used to become old or they become or they grow old, they didn't have the energy to do whatever the youths used to do. So though the soul is very religious, very pious, very spiritualistic, but the body that has been covered that soul is like a tattered coat upon a stick. Tattered coat upon a stick like the, the code that we use uh, in scarecrow in fields to scare the crows or some other birds from 
uh, in our fields that is in our, in our farming fields okay so he has compared his you know masses uh, you can say that the flesh of his body and the bones of his body with poultry thing and tethered coat okay next one is and therefore i have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of byzantium and that's why he is saying that okay i do not want to be there because that is not the country for me anymore so that's why i have sailed to byzantium the city of what the city of singing masters where i can sing the songs of spirituality of peace of calmness of ease and tranquility okay the next one is so these are some of the you know very important lines that has been taken from the particular book these are the beginning lines so maybe this is the a very important line of the second stanza and this is from the third stanza okay this is the last line i think uh the next one is the summary okay let me check once more okay so let's talk about the summary or let's talk about the gist of the particular poem that is sailing to byzant here the poet w b eats so let me tell you one more thing is that we have talked about rabindranath tagore who received nobel prize in 1913 for his own uh, collection of poetry that is called song of friends in english and in its original name it is called gitanjali so the book was published written by rabindranath tagore himself he the poems were originally written in bengali and then he translated himself into english but the foreword of that particular book was being written by w b eats because w b eats was a friend of whom of rabindranath tagore both of them used to live together in england maybe sorry in england or ireland i think in england at the time it was europe so they used to live together sometimes and uh, almost 10 years later of uh, rabindranath nobel prize he also got w b eats also got nobel prize in 1923 so this was a very interesting fact regarding both these great writers okay as rabindranath tagore is famous in india and out of the india as well because he is called vishwa kavi okay vishwa kavi that means the poet of the world and uh, similarly w b h is also very famous in ireland and he is also famous throughout the world because of his spiritual writing because of his you know, you know uh, deep thinking and deep philosophies of life that can be found in his work apart so let's see the summary of this particular one. he hopes the saints will consume his heart and away and wishes to be gathered into the artifice of eternity now what he is saying is that when he will go to byzantium the saints will be there they will consume his heart and gather it okay like uh, maybe he is thinking that okay he has gone to a blacksmith he will you know uh, make the iron that is the heart very you know very hard and then it will be beaten and make something beautiful so here he is also thinking that okay whatever he has done whatever he has uh, you know done in his during his life during his youth that will be erased okay when he will be there in uh, byzantium the speaker says that once he has been taken out of the natural world he will no longer take his bodily form from any natural things but rather will fashion himself as a singing bird made of hammered gold such as grecian goldsmiths make it make to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set up on a tree of gold to sing the lords and the ladies of byzantium so he is actually comparing himself okay that if any time this happens that okay i have lived this natural world that means i died and i have get this opportunity but okay if you want to be something you will be so what he will want to be is that he will become a golden bard who will sing throughout the country that will be listened by the lords and the ladies of byzantine okay so he want to become a very very beautiful golden bard okay 
<laughs> next one the poet says also that uh, once he is out of the cycle of nature cycle of nature that means uh, being begotten born and dying okay he will cease contact with the natural things the physical world okay so he will not lead any kind of contact here the poet's songs will be different from the sensual music of the dying generations and he will sing the sing of the monuments unaging internet okay so as we have music right now the music that we used to listen puspa hmm. raj you have i hope that you must have watched the movie puspa okay puspa the rising and that movie has a craze throughout the world there are so many significant you know, significant movements dialogues steps that actually become popular within day so he is actually talking about that okay i am not going to sing i am not going to talk about such kind of thing that is happening but what i am going to talk about is something that is related to the monuments of unaging intellect okay the intellect that has no age that is permanent something that is pure that is pious okay now in the metrical form selling to byzantium follow ottava rima that's i already have talked about ottava rima stranger pattern okay now there is a rhyme scheme obviously in that particular poem and we will talk about that okay now, yet however modifies the form to suit his own purpose even though he has used this particular form that is ottava rima he has used his own form as well to suit his own idea to express his idea in a very clear and vivid way he modifies the form to suit his own purpose swing ten syllables instead of original 11 and using slant rhymes instead of exact ones so he has made some kind of variation of syllables okay so if it is a iambic pentameter line then obviously there will be 10 syllables but sometimes it has 11 syllables sometimes uh, you know 10 syllables so he has messed up with such kind of variation it is a poem of four eight line stanzas takes a very old verse form they are metered in iambic pentameter and rhymed as a b a b a b c c now this will be the rhyme is okay there will be a kind of rhyme as we have nursery rhymes isn't that i wonder lonely as a cloud that is also from daffodil poems okay so when there will be rhyme one two buckle my shoe three four saddle door so when there will be rhyme the end words will be have rhyme uh, rhyming word okay so the rhyming word will be like the first line and the third line will have rhyme the second and fourth line will have rhyme so this is how these eight lines will have a particular rhyme scheme so this is all about the two texts okay this is all about the two texts that we have talked about hmm. just a minute yes so if you have any question you can ask me otherwise i will start something else from my own topic that is the growth of english language i will take the class at we start the class at 3 pm today you must have to join that class as well okay i am taking this class on behalf of the bia ma'am as she is off today so i am on behalf of her i am taking this class so my class will be on time but if i have as i have already some times here so we can talk about some things from my own topic if you want me to talk about that otherwise well, we can discuss some things related to these two topics that is selling to byzantium and sons and lovers if you have anything you can tell me sir well, can you please explain the uh, rhyme scheme uh, this stanza how this form and i am big meter okay so it is a bit difficult to you know discuss it within using pen and papers or uh, white boards or any kind of you know, markers so yes just let me tell you okay in a very historical form okay 
this is a very important thing because you know if you want to understand this iambic pentameter trosic okay there are so many meters i hope that all of you are attending my classes we have talked about accent isn't that we have talked about intonation we have talked about falling rising tone rising tone falling tone syllables words isn't that so we have talked all about this so until and unless you will have a good comment on all these things you will not be able to divide the syllables i had given you an example that in hindi there is a word called mantri means one who is a minister now in mantri we do not have any stress in this particular word because in india we do not have any you know system of putting extra pressure on a particular syllable of a word but in english you are supposed to follow that okay as for example if you will say minister there is three syllables and i told you that okay what is a syllable whenever you divide a word if a word have one syllable two syllable three syllable four five six seven eight nine ten okay more than one also like take the word a okay a for that means one or one thing isn't that this is a book now here a is already a syllable okay my screen is my screen visible to you no so, sir screen is visible but the okay so, okay let, let me open my uh, word pad so that i can get something in my screen okay is it visible now is it visible yes visible let's clarify me okay let me use this one and i will uh, okay i hope i it will be helpful for us okay now see there is a called gold minister okay me the nis this is an another syllable and then t e r these are three syllables okay now in one of the syllables there will be you know there will be a kind of stress okay now the stress mark sometimes put as you know vertical bars over here okay now me nestar so always put the uh, you can say that put the you know stress on vowel sounds okay try to put in vowel sound that is i okay so this is how we divide as for example a is a word isn't that so this word has only one syllable that's why it is called monosyllable mono means one single now see this word like uh, two but let's take it da this word is also a single syllable or monosyllabic okay then you can you can take some other words like my name as well okay now d e l w a r now see if you will divide this it will have two syllables okay now the portion of a particular word will be pronounced at a time without releasing or without keeping the air okay without changing the motion of the motion of the word you can see here me nista you cannot pronounce this particular word at once or twice you have to have take some breath or release some breath from your mouth okay like take the example here me nista so you cannot say minis okay you cannot say minis you have to say me nis ta you have to take the pause okay so this is very important while we, we talk about uh, uh what is that is prosody prosody okay now prosody is the form where we used to scan some lines okay see this is a uh, for example take this is a line of poetry this is an, another line of poetry now what you have to do there are two things to be remembered over here all the words of that particular line should be divided first into syllables okay all the words has to be divided into syllables 
once you will divide them then you have to know you have to divide it into fourths okay now see there are five fourths in this particular line now when there will be one foot it, it could be a uh, monometer okay there is two foot that is diameter when there will be three foot it will be called tetrameter when there will be four uh, four foot it will be called sorry trimeter and four foot tetrameter and five foot pentameter okay so here one foot is there two three four and five so it is monometer diameter trimeter tetrameter and pentameter if there will be an another foot like six one it will be called hexameter okay hexameter so this is what is called hexameter so based on this now these foods are also based on syllables if you will take two syllables in a food it is called disyllabic food okay if you will take one syllable in a food it will be called one syllabic food if you will take three syllables in a foot, it will be called trisyllabic foot. So we have only three types of foot: one syllabic, two syllabic, and three syllabic foot. Okay. And if that particular line has five foots, that will be called pentameter. If it will be called one foot, it will be monometer. Okay. Is it clear to you? See. Now there are there are several types of prosody. One is Two syllabic that is disyllabic foot. In disyllabic foot, we have okay. So in disyllabic foot, we have um, we have I am we have I am. A sorry I A M B. We have iambic, okay. We have prosaic. Prosaic. These are regular foods, okay. Iambic and prosaic. Now in iambic, what happened? If there is a syllable like twinkle, twinkle. Okay, let me write the word twinkle over here. Difficult to write. Twin, okay, and C L E. Now you have to divide the uh, syllable like this, okay, putting a hyphen in between. Now twinkle is a word and it is a disyllabic foot, okay. Now here, see if the stress is placed on the first syllable, okay. It is called, and always remember that you have to put the stress on the root words, okay? Not on the suffixes and affixes, and not in the prepositions, conjunctions. Always put the stress on the root words, on the main words, like function, not the functional words. So here, twinkle, twing is the uh, actual form of that word. Now, kel is could be a affix or the suffix of that word. So here, if you will put it on the first syllable, it is called this one, prosaic, okay? And unfortunately, like, just for understanding, I'm not using any other word, just for understanding, if you will put the syllable over here, it will become iambic, you got it? Is it clear? So if the syllable of a disyllabic foot is placed on the first syllable, it is called prosaic. If it is placed on the second syllable, it is called iambic. Now, if both the fields, if both the syllables are accented, now what it would be called? It would be called spondy. Okay, it will be called spondy. I am only talking about two syllabic foot. Okay, disyllabic foot. There is trisyllabic foot as well. So let's talk about disyllabic foot only. If you have any other query, you can talk about uh, you know talk you know ask this question to your madam. 
the bear me because she will clarify the next one so i am with prosaic and spondy if both the syllables are accented it is called spondy now take this example as well if none of the syllable if none of the syllable are accented so what it would be called it would be called pyric what p h y double r i c it will be called pyric if none of the syllables so in disyllabic code there are four types one is i am big and Prosic. These are regular food and these are exceptional. Okay, that is phyric and spondy. These are exceptional cases. If both the syllables are accented, it is called spondy. If none of them are accented, it is called phyric. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So thanks for this. And we will also, if uh, you can also ask me this in my class, that is from 3 to 4.30. I will also talk about the other uh, three types that is from trisyllabic code. Like, if you will take, uh, let me erase this. Okay, if you will talk about trisyllabic code, as for example, what is happening?